Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yesterday you guys were the only class that actually started learning. We just ran out of time for the other classes. So I even kind of forgot. What did we even talk about yesterday? Not much, huh? No, we talked about logic. What is logic? The science of reasoning. And again, the reason we study logic before we can study high-level mathematics is you have to be able to think logically. And I think we talked about every statement in the kind of logic that we're going to learn is either true or false. There's no in-between. So we're going to study two-value logic. Okay, and then we took a look at some simple examples of statements. Yeah. So normally, we, we designate statements starting with the lowercase letter p. And then if there's another one, then we use q, and then r, and then s. Anyway, so let's review what we did yesterday. So if, if statement P is X equals 2, and what, what is this then? So this class we didn't do. The negation of P, or we just simply say not P. Not P. So what would the negation of X equals 2 be? X is not equal to 2. See how simple this is? What about X is greater than 3? Okay, so when you have a simple statement, it's very simple to negate it. Okay, but now we're going to look at more complicated ones. The first one is called the universal statement. This is all in your notes. Are you good looking at your notes? It would be good to have your notes in front of you as we go through the lecture. But it's up to you. Okay, let me just give you an example of the universal statement. For all real numbers x and y, comma, x plus y cubed is equal to x cubed plus y cubed. Now, why do you think they call this a universal statement? Look at the first two words. For all, we're talking about all the real numbers. So for all real numbers, x and y, this would be true. Now remember, every statement is either true or false, yeah? So what do you think? Is this statement true or false? Now you should have learned this in algebra too. You shouldn't even have to think. False. It's false. Now some of, some of you are probably going, what? Don't you just distribute the q? Are you crazy? You don't distribute powers. Now, if you want it, okay, so we know this is false. Now, first thing, first thing. We don't, mathematicians, we don't like to write out all these words. So we have symbols, okay? So this is how we symbolize this statement, so we don't have to write as much. So you can probably guess this symbol means for all, <laughs> for all, x and y are elements of the real numbers. Now, can I assume that you guys know your, the different sets of numbers? Like if I say real numbers, integers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, whole numbers, natural numbers, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, well, let me just give you a test then. What is the smallest whole number? Count. One, zero. Eight. So which is it? <laughs> no, it's zero. zero. Ah, so we don't know. What is the smallest natural number? Page. What's a natural number? No, it's one. <laughs> okay, now, obviously we don't know our sets of numbers, so you know what you do? You look at the notes. Should I scroll down in the notes? I think it's on the very last page. I give you the set of all the numbers that you're supposed to know. The last page of notes, not the last page of the whole packet, yeah? The last page of the notes. No, go, 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 go back up. Okay, yeah, it should be there. There it is, right there. It's on the page right before the worksheets. 
Those are all the sets of numbers that you should know. You should know the different. Well, okay, let's just pretend we don't know anything. What is the set of all the numbers that we know? Oh my goodness. It's called the complex numbers. We learned this last year. Okay, let's go. We're going to have to digress then. Erase this. Forget this for now. We've got to go backwards. Uh, all the numbers we know are called complex numbers, capital letter C. Complex. Now, what the heck is a complex number? Mason, impress me. So all the numbers we know, including the imaginary one. <laughs> you just repeated what I said. It's all the numbers. Yeah, so what are all the numbers we know? It, okay, including imaginary, so you're on the right track there. A complex number is a number that can be written in the form a plus b i. A. Okay, did we or did we not learn this last year? Three plus four i. We we learned how to work with. This is a complex number. It has a real part and it has an imaginary part. What is the real part? Three. What is the imaginary part? No, it's four. Oh my goodness. Is this the right class? This is the real part. <laughs> this is the imaginary part. You put them together, you get the complex numbers. That's all the numbers we know. Oh my goodness. Anyway, the complex numbers can be broken up into two disjoint subsets. Now, do you guys know what I mean when I say disjoint? Yeah, they don't overlap. How come the 10th grader knows? And you, know, you understand what I mean when I say subset? First of all, do you know what a set is? Okay, let's go back even further. <laughs> Here is set A. One, two, three. That is a set. Okay? So what would be a subset of A? True or false? This is a subset of set A. Yes, it's a subset. It's part of it. That's, come on, let's get it hard. Okay, anyway, the complex numbers can be can be broken up into two disjoint subsets, and what are they? One are the real numbers, capital R represents the real numbers, and the other one, the imaginary numbers. Now, normally, imaginary numbers, I don't think we even have, does it even have anything on the notes? No, I don't think there is anything for that, so we just say the imaginary numbers. Now, the real numbers can be broken up into two disjoint subsets, and what are they? The rational numbers and the irrational numbers. Okay, now before we go any further, do we know the difference between rational and irrational? Okay, uh, what, what is a rational? Now I know this was in chapter one of the algebra two book. What is a rational number? Oh! One. Think about it, rational. What? Rational. What's the root word? Rat. No, it's not rat. <laughs> it's ratio. So what's what's a rational number? Okay, could you? What if I give you a number? Can you tell me if it's rational or not? If I give you a number. Okay, go. Oh, point six. Is that a rational number? Yes. Why? Because Mr. Rubash said it so. Yeah. No, because you can write it as a ratio of two integers, 3 over 5. If you can write a number as a ratio of two integers, then that's a rational number. See, rational, ratio. What about point 2 repeating? Is that a rational number? Yes. Yes, because you can write that as a ratio of two, of two integers. And what are those two integers? <laughs> 2 over 9, right? No, wait, 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 time out. Do I even have to show you how to change a, 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 what do you call that, a repeating decimal to a fraction? You guys learned how to do that right last year. Okay, what if you're in a Turkish, we're not even talking about this anymore. <laughs> what if you're in a Turkish prison, and the only way you can get out is I'm going to give you a, a repeating decimal and you have to change it to a fraction. Could you do it, or are you going to just rot in there for the rest of your life? <laughs> <laughs> like most of you just know point two repeating is two nines, right? Because you learned that in what kindergarten or preschool? Come on, point one. What do you think point one repeating is? One nine. 
What is point four repeating? Four nines. I see a pattern, Mr. Park. What is point three repeating? Three nines, which is one third. Whoa! You see a pattern to this? You know. Okay, but what if I give you something more challenging? What about point one two repeat? Point one two one two one two one two. Yeah, exactly, that's 12 over 99, and of course you can reduce that, right? I see a pattern! What is point three, four, five repeating? What do you think that is, based on this pattern? Three, four, five over 999. Come on, you guys know this just for playing with your calculator when you were in elementary school, right? Just to see things, how things Okay, but what if you're in a Turkish prison and I give you something like way more difficult, like point two, Five, 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 repeating. Just the fives repeat. Well, first of all, is that a rational number? Come on, 50 50 chance. <laughs> Come on, what did your teacher teach you? Any repeating decimal is a rational number. Okay, now you're in a Turkish prison. The only way you can get out, who's going to get out? You got to be able to change that to a fraction, otherwise, you stay in here forever. Manago! What did Mr. Rubash or Mr. Tangiyasin teach you? Or your pre, uh, I would guess the first time you learned this is in pre-algebra. No? I'm kind of joking when you learned it in elementary school. Although some people probably did learn it in elementary school. Mason? No. Takata? Probably preschool, yeah. Okay, anyway, what did we learn? Manago, impress me. We don't know what this number is, so you call it x. Okay, now, what do you want, want to do? You want to multiply it by 10, multiply it by 100, 100x, 10x, 1000x? Some of you just don't know. Okay, let's just start. What, the, what is 10x equal to? What is 10x? How do you multiply a number by 10? You move the decimal. What? <laughs> One to the right. And you do 2.555. Wait, 2.5555. Repeating. And then what do you do? It rhymes with mock track. You subtract. 10x minus 1x is... Do I really have to dump it down this much? And now look what happens when you subtract. What is this minus this? 2.3 and then everything else all cancels out, right? All the 5s minus 5s all cancel out. So therefore x is equal to... 2.3 over 9. Does that prove it's a rational number? No, because that's not an integer. It has to be an integer over an integer. Is that an integer? Wait, I don't even know what an integer is, Mr. Park. Look at the notes. Let me ask, okay, let me ask a question. What is the smallest integer? How do I know? Zero. No, there is no smallest one. You guys are falling for the only straight in the book. These, are you guys even looking at the notes? I these are the integers. There is no smallest one. Okay, so 2.3 is not an integer. So, but, so what can I do to make it an integer over an integer? Multiply top and bottom by 10, so you get 23 over 9. Can that be reduced? Do we really have to think about that? 23 is a prime number. <laughs> no, you cannot reduce that anymore. <laughs> We never scream, we're even look at this 10 minutes and it's still talking about this. Gosh. Are you guys the smartest of the four classes? Yeah. This, or this is just a har harbinger of what's going to come for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so since you can write this, okay, what was the original problem? This. Since you can write that as a ratio of two integers, then therefore it's a rational number. Any repeating decimal is a rational number. Okay, so now we know what a rational number is. So what do you think an irrational number is? A number that cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. For example, pi. everybody, eyes go down. Ma. Pi. Okay, pi is a good one. What about square root of two? What about square root of three? What about q root of two? Yeah, those are all irrational numbers. You cannot write it as a ratio of two integers. Now, here are the rational numbers. Now you know what a rational number is? So it's all terminating and repeating decimals. That's basically what it is. 
So what, what would be a subset of that directly below this subset? Integers. Uh, integers. And what do we call it, integers? Capital letter rhymes with D. Z. Z. And I wrote it on the board too. And then what's a subset of the integers? See right here. Subset of the integers. What, what do you call those numbers that start from zero? It's the whole numbers, capital letter W. And then what's a subset of the whole numbers, that are those numbers there? One, the natural numbers. So these are all the numbers that you need to know in this class, well, if you learn mathematics. Now, I'm sure you learned these, but you guys are just rusty from the summer. Yeah? It's not like you don't know it. <laughs> okay, now that we know the numbers, now we can go back to this final. Okay, so what, what did I just show you? I showed you how to symbolize it. So for all, so when you see this, x and y are elements of the real numbers. Okay, so for all real numbers, x and y, this, but we already know it's false. Now, maybe on the next quiz I might ask you, okay, this is a false statement. What do you have to change this to to make it true? So all you have to do is remember algebra 1, algebra 2, x plus y quantity cubed. What is that? If I were to expand that, what would you get? You don't just distribute the cube, right? If, if math was that easy, right? Because then, oh, if you have cosine x plus y, just distribute the cosine. Is that what we learned in trigonometry? It rhymes with mole. No. No. If you have natural log x plus y, just distribute the natural log. Like that. If math was only that easy, yeah? But it's not. You can't distribute. In fact, most situations you cannot distribute. You gotta use mathematics what you learn. X plus Y quantity cube. Quick, somebody impress me. This. I remember one year a student said that. That's true though, right? Isn't that true? <laughs> That's what cube means. But come on. Okay, Takara, you're getting you're getting mixed up with the different the sum of cubes. Isn't it? Okay, then you know what? Let me just write it on the board then. X cubed plus three x squared y plus three x y squared plus y cubed. Does that even look familiar? Okay, I think we're gonna have to go back in time. Okay, let's put this on hold again. We cannot even expand a binomial. We're in trouble. Okay, first of all, do you guys know what a binomial is? Well, I don't know. You guys are just staring at me. Please don't ask me a question. A binomial is two terms, like bicycle, got two wheels. Oh, now I get it. That's a binomial. And then we learned how to raise it to powers, yeah? What is x plus y to the zero power? One. What is x plus y to the one power? Come on, you better get this. x plus y. What is x plus y quantity squared? That's algebra 1a x squared plus 2xy plus y cubed. When you go to algebra 2, we to, it is y squared. Just look at the video. x plus y cubed is x cubed plus 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. That's minimum if you took algebra 2. But then now, what happens when you go x plus y to the 4 or, or x plus y to the 10? Or, since most of you are juniors, you're, you're class of what, 2015? 14? 15? What about x plus y to the 2015? That's the kind of like to put on the test. <laughs> what do you do? How do you expand it? What did your teacher teach you? Pascal's triangle. Thank you. Pascal's triangle. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, I, I guarantee you, Pascal Strike, you should have learned like second, third grade around there. But that's the first time you learn. You might not understand all the patterns, but that's when you learn it, right? So you start with ones and you make a triangle like this. And the ones are always on the outside. How do you figure out the numbers on the inside? Oh, so now you know. You pretend you don't know, and now you know. What's happening? So 1 plus 1 is 2. You put 1's on the outside, so the next line, what? You add the two numbers above it. 1 plus 2, 
rhymes with dean. Is that what it takes to get you to answer? Two plus one, three. Okay, one, one's, on, one's on the outside, then what? Four. Okay, so one of the things, just one of the things you can use Pascal's triangle is A. Woohoo! Look, the coefficients are the, the, the numbers in Pascal's triangle. See, look, one, 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 two, one, one, three, three, one. Oh my goodness. So if I had to expand x plus y to the fourth power, what do you think it would be? x to the four plus four x cubed y plus six x squared y squared plus four x y cubed plus one y to the fourth. And that's how you expand binomials raised to a power. Come on, we learned this in algebra two. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to go any further because I could talk all day on this binomial, this Pascal triangle thing. But let me, let, me, let me ask you this. Okay, what if last year, Mr. Rubash or Mr. Takisu, what if they gave you x plus y to the 100th power? You cry. <laughs> Paige, I didn't expect that from her. So <laughs> what would, we would just keep on going. So now this is called the, the zero row. You know why we start? Normally, this is the first row, but we call it the zero row. You know why? And this is the first row. So the second one is actually the first one. You know why? Because it corresponds to the power, see, x plus y to the zero. So we call that the zero rule. So if you want to expand x plus y to the fourth, you go to the fourth row. So if you want to expand x plus y to the hundredth, you have to go to the hundredth row. Okay, let's go. I'll do the next one. 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Okay, that's the fifth row. Okay, sixth row. Okay, seventh row. And we just keep on going till we get to the hundred. Are you crazy? We're not gonna do that. Some of you wouldn't even make it to the tenth row. You're probably making a rental big mistake or something. So, so there must be a way of getting these numbers without actually having to go all the way down. Come on, algebra two. And if you were in my SAT prep class this summer, I think I told you. Huh? Yeah, I know it's a pattern, but what is what is the pattern? Oh, I gotta compose myself. <laughs> you guys were okay. You learned in algebra too. Okay, now you know what? We're just stopping there. There is no pattern. No more pattern. Yes. We, we're gonna learn that. Well, uh, obviously we're gonna learn it because it, it seems like we don't know it. But I will teach you that pattern later. Can we at least expand the first few ones using Pascal's triangle? I'll, I'll just be happy with that. Okay, good. But you're gonna, well, if you look in your notes, no, never mind, don't go back. <laughs> never mind. Okay, so this is called, a, this is like 20 minutes ago already. This is called a universal statement because of the first two letters. We're talking about all real numbers. Okay, and look at the format. Look at, look at the, the way that it's, that it's set up. For all something, comma, something. That's what a universal statement looks like. For all box, comma, oval. It doesn't matter what words you put in there. If it has that form, that's called a universal statement. Okay, now let's call this statement P. And it doesn't matter if you write it in words or symbols. Now, when you do tonight's homework, I don't care if you write it out in words or you write it out in symbols. It doesn't matter to me. But if you want to become a real mathematician, you probably use the symbols. Okay, so this is statement P, a universal statement. What we have to do now is we have to learn how to negate it. What is the negation of statement P? Now, if you look in your notes, it tells you how to do it. That's why if you do it in symbols, it's very simple. Here, in fact, here, let me, let me just boil it down for you. Let me dumb it down for you. Every universal statement looks like this. For all box, comma, over. Okay? That's it's called a universal statement. If you want to negate it, all you have to do is this. Oh, you know what? You know what? I can't tell you about that yet, sorry. Because I've got to teach you one more thing. Next thing, never mind, pretend I just didn't, I never said that. The next one is called an existential statement. Okay, let me give you an, an example of an existential statement. There exists 
where it exists. Uh, uh, integers, no! Yeah, integers A and B such that pi equals A over B. Now, why do you think they call this an existential statement? Look at the first two words. Exist. There exists. Now, in mathematics, what does there exist mean? It's in the complex stuff. Complex number? No, no, no. Just what, what does there exist mean? That means there's at least, rhymes with bun, one. one. There, is, there exists, so there's at least one pair of integers A and B such that pi equals A over B. Okay, now is this statement true or false? Can you find two integers? I think we answered that question about seven minutes ago. Can you find two integers so that when you divide them, you get pi? How do you know? This is what, this is what, okay, you're right, this is false. That's because pi is an irrational number, right? But every year, like our last, just last year, they said, Mr. Park, my pre-algebra teacher taught me that pi is 22 over 7. I mean, I don't know, maybe some of you think that now. Well, it's, no, it's not. Pi is approximately 22 over 7. That's the approximation we use in, in pre-algebra. You guys learned that, right? But let me show you how bad an approximation that is. Okay, now, pi, we know, is, give me 15 decimal place accuracy. Takara, go. Okay, good enough. 15 decimal places is good enough. Right? Everybody knows that, right? <laughs> okay. Now, what about 22 over 7? Now, 22 over 7, isn't that 3 and 1 7? Yes, so, so 22 over 7 will be, okay, I'll do the 3 by 3 <laughs> point, 1, 4, one, four two, 2, 8, Mason, finish it, 5, Come on, this is common knowledge for math team. Oh, yeah. If you don't know your decimal for 1, 7, go home and cook rice already. <laughs> what, okay, do we know our decimals for simple fractions? Okay, we've got to go back. We've got to go back in time. One half, what is the decimal for that? What about one third? One fourth. One fifth. How come you guys know that? One sixth. What? Point one six repeating. One seventh. That's the one I point one four two eight five. Yeah. Point one four two eight five seven repeating. That's one seventh. I'm afraid to even ask. What about one nine one eight? Point one two five. If you're going into business, you you gotta know that. Because when they give interest rates, they always do it in eights. One nine. We just talked about that. Point one repeating, and you better get this one. Point ten. Yeah, if you miss that one, just go home. Don't even cook rice. Just go home. <laughs> okay, and just I just want to see how we get one eleven. Mason, redeem yourself after that one seven screw up. Zero point nine. No zero point. Zero nine zero nine. Okay, there you go. Point zero nine repeating. Common knowledge. Okay, no, 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 one. That's just a fun. One twelve. Whole two. Uh, no. no, you can't. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you a hint. Isn't one twelve just half of one sixth? Yes. So you know one sixth. So just half it. Point zero eight. Say what, girlfriend? <laughs> Point zero eight. But, um, okay, maybe if you see it like this. So it would be point zero 0.08 repeating with the 8. <laughs> the 8 is we know. 
Three is hard. Oh, yeah. Because look, six, 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 half of that is tree, 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 right? Okay. See, that, is, is that how you guys think? Or you just try to memorize things? The capital of Montana is Helena. <laughs> is that what you guys do? Just memorize things? Or you try to figure out how, why they work? Anyway, since we're on the topic of 17, okay, forget it, we're gonna have to sidetrack again. Do you know what's special about 17? Well, 0.142857. We call this a cyclic number. Okay, if you were to do 27, let me just save you some time. You know what 27 would be? 0.285714, repeating. You see a pattern to that? Or these are just random things. Okay, let's do 37. What do you think 37 is? 0.428571, repeating. Do you see a pattern? Yeah, Mr. Park, it's the same numbers. But not just the same numbers, they're in the same order. It just starts at a different point. That's why they call it cyclic. It cycles. Oh, boy. Four sevenths. What do you, okay, based on these three examples, what, what do you think four sevenths is? Point, what, what do you think it's going to start with? Five, five. Yeah, it's going to start with the five, so you just go in the same order. Five, seven, one, four, two, eight. Ooh. Some of you are going, what? What's going on? Five, okay, let's just skip to six sevenths already. What do you think six sevenths is? Which is the biggest? It's going to start with the eight. So point eight, five, seven, one, four, two, repeating. That's what's special about one seven. Okay, now we can go back to this thing. And oh my god, we're in a heap of trouble. Get the blood pressure medicine. There exist integers a and b, so, so we already established that it's false because pi is an irrational number. You cannot write that as a. Anyway, getting back to that 22 7, so you can see that they're not equal. Anyway, in geometry, your geometry teacher taught you a good fraction that, that approximates pi, right? Like this is okay, 3.142. In fact, you know, in the, like 500 BC, you know what they used to use as an approximation for pi? They used to use the square root of 10. That's just ridiculous. What is the square root of 10? Give me three decimal places. Paige, redeem yourself. Uh -huh. Okay, I could have gotten that. <laughs> okay, next, Silva. Okay, I'll just tell you. One, six, two. Look how way off that is. That's terrible. Okay, but the Chinese. How many of you are Chinese? That's racist, put your hands up. <laughs> the Chinese learned a very good approximation for pi, and I'm sure your geometry teacher taught you this. It's 355 over 113. That's a really good approximation for pi. Right? Now, Mr. Masanaga? You guys go, oh yeah, he did say something about that, right? Okay, who has their, did you, have, did you download the pocket cast? Okay, somebody compute that. That's just computing a number. Or use your graphing calculator, whatever. 355 over 113. What is that? Manav is just staring. <laughs> somebody, somebody will get it. I don't need to. <laughs> okay, 3 point. One, four, one, five, nine, two, nine, two, zero, three, five, three. Okay, good enough. So approximately. That's a pretty good approximation. You got six decimal place accuracy. Those Chinese knew what they were doing. So 3.141592 right there, six decimal place accuracy, baby. You guys never saw that before? Oh my goodness. And not only that, some of you go, how am I expected to remember this? Like 22 over 7, I can remember. What is this 355 over 113? But it's easy to memorize this. What did Mr. Masanada say? Yeah, it's just the first three odd numbers. One, one, three, three, five, five. What's an odd number? <laughs> okay, anyway, just like the universal, my gosh, are we going to even finish? What time does this class end? What time does this class start? 
Oh, thank point. goodness. If this wasn't extended, we'd be in trouble. Now, just like the universal statement, mathematicians, we don't like to write out words. We want to symbolize. So here we go. There is this. Boom. And that's how we symbolize. So you can probably guess this, this symbol here looks like a backwards capital E means there exists A and B, which are elements of the integers. That's why you got to know the main ones, the integers, right? What do you think this back? So you guys know this means is an element though, right? Or do I have to backtrack on that? You guys got it? Is an element of? Okay, so this backwards is a, this is like a Greek letter epsilon. You guys ever heard of epsilon? So this is like backwards, and you can probably guess that the backwards one means such that pi equals a over b. You just got to get used to it. It's just symbols. Okay, so these are the only two statements you got to know tonight. Okay, you got the universal statement, and you got the existential statement. Okay, now what you have to learn how to do is you have to learn how to negate them. Okay, it's not a simple statement like the ones we looked at before, like x equals 2. If you negate that, you get x not equal to 2. Okay, now, the beauty of symbolic logic, in other words, doing logic with symbols, is that you just look at the form. You don't even have to worry about the meaning of the words. Okay, so here, let's say statement P is... A universal statement. Now, all universal statements have the, the, the same form. For all box, comma, oval. If you want to negate it, all you have to do is do this. There exists box such that not oval. It's the same form. That's how you negate a universal statement. The negation of a universal statement is an existential statement. Doesn't that make sense, though? Because what if somebody said, okay, let's look at that one we had here. For all real numbers x and y, x plus y cubed is equal to x cubed plus y cubed. If somebody said, this is true, what would it take to prove that person wrong? If somebody said, for all real numbers x and y, this is true, what would it take to prove that person wrong? What was that word we used in geometry? You just have to give a... Rhymes with mounter example. A counter example. Which is just like one case that proves that it's wrong, right? And does, is, doesn't that what mean there exists mean? There exists means there's at least one. So it only makes sense that the, that the negation of a, of, a, of a universal statement will be an existential statement. Now look at the form. There exists box such that not triangle. I mean, not oval. Okay, so here, here's statement P. It's a universal statement. How do I negate it? Just follow this. So it's going to be, there exist real numbers, x and y, such that, now if this is oval, what would not oval be? x plus, come on, people. It is not equal to x cubed plus y cubed. That's how simple this is. It doesn't matter what the words are. You just, if you have that form, that's how you negate it. That's the beauty of this thing. Now, what did we establish? That this was true or false? This is false. Now, remember, if we're only learning, there's only two values, true or false, right? So, if this statement is false, then what do you think its negation should be? It's true. And is it? Let me just think about it. Yeah, because there's only two possibilities. That's what negation means. If this one is false, that one has to be true. If this one is true, that one has to be false. Okay, now what about the other way? What if statement Q is an existential statement? There exists box such that triangle. I, I rather use triangle than oval. How do you think I'm going to negate that? What do you think? If the negation of a universal is existential, what do you think if you negate an existential? It will be universal. So for all box, comma, not triangle. Or is that confusing, confusing you or should I, go, should I go back to the oval? Okay, don't answer. Okay, so let's look at an example. Let's look at an example I gave. What was the example I gave? There exist integers A and B 
such that pi is equal to a over b. That's an existential statement. How do you negate that? Just follow the form. Look, there exists box such that triangle. So how do you negate that? Look, it's right, it's right. For all box, comma, not triangle. So if triangle is pi equals a over b, what is not that? Pi is not equal to a over b. And there you go. That's how you indicate. It's very simple. You just follow the form. My dog can do this. He just can't figure out if it's true or false. Though. Now, we already established that this is what? That's false. So therefore, by default, this one is true. There you go. Are you guys get, catching on? See, what, okay, logic is not difficult. You just follow the form. What's difficult for you guys is, you guys don't know how to expand. You guys don't know what a rational number is. My voice is getting high. Don't worry, you guys will catch on. Okay, now, next thing we gotta learn tonight are true tables and then we're done. I thought we were gonna finish really early today, but you proved me wrong. Okay, now, what the heck is a true table? Well, basically, a true table just shows you all the different values for a given statement. Okay, now this is the simple one, the simplest one. Now if you have a statement P, now remember we're only doing two valued logic, right? How many different values are there? Two. It's either true or false, right? So the simplest of all the true tables is this one. This is all in your notes now, not P. So if statement P is true, well, then what is not P? It's false. If statement P is false, then not P is True. There you go. That's called true table. It just shows you all the different values for a certain statement. Okay, but not all statements are that easy. Okay, let's move on. Now, before, oh my goodness, I'm scared to even do this. Do you guys know the difference between or and and, and union and intersection, or do we need to review that? Not sure about the union. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, so let's go back to elementary school. Set A is 1, 2, 3. Set B is 2, 3, 4. What would be set A union set B? What does union mean? You gotta know this on the SAT, by the way. Okay, this is what union means. If you put all of these numbers in a box, you put all of those numbers in a box, what's in the box? That's union. That's what union is. Okay. What about intersection? That's the symbol for intersection. Intersection is what elements are common to both sets. So the answer would be two and three. So now do we know the difference between union and intersection. And then what about or and and? Well, or is like union, and is like intersection. Okay. Let me give you an example. What if you have x is greater than 2 or x is greater than 3? Oh, how would you simplify that? If you put all of these numbers, or is like union now. If you put all of these numbers in a box and you put all of those numbers in a box, what's in the box? x is greater than 2. So this would simplify to x is greater than 2. You get it? But what if I use the word and in between? x is greater than 2 and x is greater than 3. And means intersection, where they overlap. What numbers are common to both of these? x is greater than 3. You see the difference? Well, Mr. Parker, why don't they just use the same symbol? That's because you use this, they have the same meaning. But this symbol is used between two sets. We use this between two statements. You see the difference? Okay, now, in logic, what happens when you have two statements? See, this one is only one statement, so it's easy. What happens when you have two statements, or three or four? Well, are there more possibilities? Yes. Okay, now, if you have two statements, P and Q, and you want to make a truth table, how many possibilities are there going to be now? There's going to be four, that's right. And how do you know it's four? Because P is either true or false, Q is either true or false, right? So. What tells you that you, what, what do you do? Two times two or two plus two? What did we learn in SAT prep? It's called the multiplication principle. 
2 times 2 is 4. Now, this is the standard way of doing it. True, true, false, false. That's P. And then Q is true, false, true, false. You do that every time. Those are all the four possibilities right there. OK, now, when you have two statements, there's lots of different ways to connect them together. Now, we only have to learn two today. Okay? The two is this one. P or Q. That symbol means R. So right here. In place of that, you could put that. And notice that hey, it looks like that. See, but see, when it's curved like that, these are two sets. But when it comes to a sharp point, then these are two statements. That's the difference. They mean exactly the same thing. That's why this, doesn't this look like a negative sign? Like 3 and negative 3? But see, numbers are negative. Statements are negated. But it has the same meaning. You know what I'm talking about? And then we have this. What do you, what do you think that is? That's N. So that's or, that's and. See? Or is like union, and and is like intersection. So, see, and, that's the symbol for and. You use it to connect two statements. Okay, now, let me just tell you. When will an or statement be true? You can kind of look at this and, and tell right there. An or statement is true when at least one of the two things is true. So you, you look at these two things. Is at least one of them true? Are you joking me? Is at least one of them true? Yes, yeah, so it's true. Is at least one of them true? Is at least one of them true? Is at least one of them true? No, so it's false. There you go. That is the truth table for the OR statement. So the only time the OR statement is false is when the two things are false. Now the AND statement, when is the AND statement true? When both of them are true. So you look at these two. Are both of them true? Yes. Are both of them true? Are both of them true? Are both of them true? There you go. And that's the true table for the AND statement. Now, based on these two things, now we can, we can do lots of things. So what you're going to do tonight, in this, the first part of your homework, I'm going to give you either a universal or an existential statement, and you have to negate it. And then you have to tell me whether the original one is true or false. Okay. The second part of tonight's homework is you're going to make true tables like this. Okay, and you got to learn from it now. Remember, these problems are not on there just to make you do homework. Now. you got to learn from it. So this is what I want from you tonight, okay? So like tonight's homework, I'm probably doing your homework for you right here, but yeah, what the heck. Make a true table for this. P or Q. No, make a true table for this. Now, what you might want to start with now, at the very beginning, when you know when you first start doing two tables, you do the training wheels like this. You have two statements, P and Q. So what are, how do I get the four possibilities? What did I just teach you? True, true, false, false. And then true, false, true, false. That's just automatic. You do that every time. That way everybody will have the same truth table. Okay. Now, make a truth table for this. Well, do we know how OR works? When is the OR statement true? When at least one of them is true. Or you can just memorize. Like you can just memorize OR is true, 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 false. It's up to you. Yeah. Anyway, you can go, at least one of them true? Yeah. At least one of them true? Yep. At least one of them true? Is at least one of them true? No. But then, that gets negated. So if this statement is true, 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 false, what do you think the negation of that's going to be? It's going to be false, 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 true. You just negate each one. And there you go. This here represents that statement, so this is how we normally do it. We put a box around it and then put an asterisk. Or do something that signifies it. Because some people can just do it in their head. They can just look at it and go, oh, false, 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 true. Some people are really good.